Kiwis like to think of themselves as being pretty good when it comes to the water, but we've only ever won six Olympic swimming medals. And the story of how we won our first official medal is kind of strange. It involves a horse trainer and a swimmer without a coach. So Kiwis think of themselves as pretty good in the water, and despite the fact that we have had an abysmal year in terms of water-related incidents around this, the country this summer, it doesn't change the fact that our competitive swimmers seem to come across quite well when it comes to international competitions. However, we've only ever won six Olympic medals for swimming, and the first one of those was in the 1912 Games where we were competing as part of an Australasian team, so that kind of doesn't count. Australia wants to claim that as their own. However, New Zealand's first Olympic medal swimmer, and to date the only female Olympic medal swimmer, Jean Stewart, has an interesting story about how she got to the point where in 1952, she placed third, winning the bronze medal. Born in 1930, Jean Stewart is pretty damn amazing. She won 10 national championships when it came to the 100 yard or 110 yard backstroke. When she came to the Empire Games in 1950 and 1954, she placed third in both of those, and in the 1952 Helsinki Olympics, she also placed third, securing New Zealand's first ever swimming medal. Now, her training regime was a little bit different, because back then, they didn't have a national coach for the swimming team. Her son, Gary Hurring, was actually once New Zealand's Olympic swimming coach, but back then, back in 1952, no such thing. In fact, she didn't have a coach at all. What she had was a friend who was kind of enthusiastic about making sure she did well, who trained horses instead. Stewart described Bill Wallace as more of a swimming enthusiast than a coach, but he brought some interesting ideas to the table that he had sort of stored from his background as a horse trainer. Now, the first one of these was the fact that Horses train for distances longer than they're actually running so that they can maintain a constant energy output the whole way. But swimmers weren't doing that at the time. They were swimming and training for the distance that they knew they had to go to. And in her case, it was normally 110 yards. But this is a period in time when we were seeing a switch from imperial to metric in a lot of places in the Olympics are a metric event, which meant going from 110 yards to 100 meters. And in a way that kind of gets in your head a little bit. So by training Jean up to swim further and keep her energy levels up, she maintained that she had a constant energy output going the whole way, didn't wear out towards the end. And that really paid off for her. Not only was Jean ready to tackle pretty much anything that could be thrown to at her in the pool, and she knew she had the experience and the energy and the training to go all the way on this, so there were also a couple of other things that kind of helped her out a little bit in a strange way that were endemic with the times. The first one being, they flew to Helsinki instead of taking a boat, which meant they had less chance to basically get fatigued, fall out of practice and have no training. They did, however, have a stop off in Sydney before they headed over to Helsinki. She wasn't allowed to swim in the training pools over there because it was men only, and as one of only two female athletes from New Zealand going over to the Helsinki Games, the other was Yvette Williams, you might remember her from the long jump, she actually shared a dorm with Jean Stewart. She was told she had to go and swim in the Sydney Harbour if she wanted to get any practice in. So that's what she did. And because the harbour has no measurements, it meant she was able to keep up her training regime that she'd been instilled with from Bill. After landing in London on their way to Helsinki, she came across the same problem. She was not allowed in the men's training pools. So she had to find other ways to train. Really problematic when they didn't even have basic gear like a stopwatch to be able to check her times. So when it came to the actual swim in Helsinki, she was more determined than ever to prove that she deserved to be there. Now the way that a swimming competition works at the Olympics is you have your heats and the winners of those heats go through, the top swim times get through to the finals. She was fourth fastest in those heats and she said herself the biggest problem that she had with the finals was that she got off to a little bit of a slow start, which is what she feels got her that third place. But she was up against world record holders. The two people that beat her were both world record holders and Olympic champions already in that event. To get a bronze with such a huge field of amazingly talented people was an absolutely brilliant outcome and one she had worked incredibly hard to achieve. 
by listening to the advice of a horse trainer who taught her that going the distance sometimes means training to go for a longer distance than you expected. So Jean Stewart's legacy is pretty impressive. Not only is she the only New Zealand swimmer in the New Zealand Sports Hall of Fame who hasn't won a gold medal somewhere along the lines, her son is still coaching out there and he was also a really really good swimmer he's won gold at world champs he's done a whole bunch of silver medal swims um, he would have gone to the moscow olympics if we hadn't have you know boycotted that the training techniques that she was using that she was taught are still in practice today she's gone through and she's inspired hundreds of other swimmers including people like sophie pascoe who is the most impressive award-winning para swimmer that has ever been Jean Stewart's legacy is going to live for a very long time and it all comes down to the fact that a friend of hers tried to teach her to swim like a horse. If you enjoyed this video don't forget to like, share and subscribe to this channel. I'll be putting out a few more of these as we go along. The one on Waitangi Day is going to absolutely blow your mind about how an entire country is founded by a man in his pajamas. So yeah, like, share and subscribe to this video so you can get more content like this as well as other crazy stuff that I do along the way.